Hello, welcome to the 10th or 12th episode of Gospel Open Data Science. I'm your host, Mark G. Bilby. Uh, today I am officially dropping the Diorosis DuckDB. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the Diorosis Ancient Greek Corpus. It's an amazing project that came out of the Turing Institute, um, headed by a team there, including Alessandro Batri and Barbara McGillivray. And um, that corpus is currently available uh, through a Creative Commons license, CC BY 4.0, um, on Figshare uh, and other places. But it's all available in XML. It's also available through a search interface that Alessandro built. So I'm going to show you that briefly. Uh, but I'm also going to show you um, a link to the database that I compiled using all of the Diorsis data and adding some new features to it that will allow for a much faster and more sophisticated uh, querying um, and, and use cases for the Diorosis data. So let's walk, start walking through that. Uh, this is the program I was mentioning. Uh, it's called Diorosis Search. So if you go to Figshare, you can find the Diorosis corpus in TEI XML. It's about 820 documents, I think, totaling 10 million Greek word tokens. Uh, includes morphological tagging, the uh, original word, uh, uh, word lemma. The words tend to be in a beta form, a beta code form, rather than Unicode. Um, in the Diorosis search application, you can actually use either beta code or Unicode UTF-8 to search the Greek text. Um, I haven't used it for Windows, partly because the application through an uh, seemed to raise some security concerns for Windows, so I haven't used it in a Windows environment, and I can't recommend it one way or the other there because of that. I have used it in a Linux environment and found that it worked pretty well in that context. But again, I'm not because I don't want to make any claims one way or the other about software and its usefulness. I'll just say that I've used it. It's, it's worked okay for me, but I'm not going to make any claims or endorsements uh, of the software one, one way or the other. But uh, the software does allow for the selection of authors. I've gone in, for instance, and defined different uh, corpora or uh, mini corpuses uh, within Greek literature. So in this case, I can load Greek novels and then I can build a query and query a specific word or a specific uh, morphological feature. Let's say I'm looking for all occasions of the optative mood across Greek novels. And, and maybe I also want to include uh, Luke Acts as part of the uh, comparison along with the novels. So I've already chosen the morphological form, the optative verb. So this application does a pretty nice job of querying pretty quickly through these, um, through these various documents. And uh, it creates a sortable list. So you can start to see across the Greek novels how often so point, about 0. 0.5 out of every 100 words is an optative mood word, uh, according to these tallies. And Luke X is pretty high. If we were to throw some more documents in there, uh, we'd actually see that Luke X ranks fairly higher compared to other documents. Um, so here, here's going to be all the Septuagint, for instance, plus Philostratus, second century, Herodotus, who so gets some history, Flavius Josephus, New Testament. So if you haven't used this, uh, it might be worth checking out. Again, I'm not going to endorse it one way or the other, but uh, if we were to run a query on all of these, it's going to take a little bit longer, but we should see some interesting results from this. So Alessandro was one of the persons who compiled the, built the Diorsis corpus, and then he developed this application as a way of accessing it uh, you know, quickly and efficiently. So we'll let that, that work. But uh, the main purpose of this episode is to debut uh, a DuckDB, which is essentially a SQL database of the Diorsis corpus, which I think I'm fully you know, within my rights to do because uh, the Diorsis corpus is licensed CC BY. So as long as I attribute the source of the data, uh, which I already have and which I do in the official documents, um, it should be good to, um, to release it. So let's see. Um, let me, I'm trying to open up. Oh yeah, it's on my Linux box. Okay, well, we can go look at the optative search results real quick, sort them and see that Philostratus, for instance, has a very high, the highest use of the optative 
Daniel in the Septuagint, Josephus is kind of next. Xenophon of Ephesus, a novelist, um, writing in the second century, Herodotus, fairly high. And then Mark, Matthew, Luke is up there, fairly high. But then if, uh, on the lower end would be Susanna. Um, I'm trying to think if there are other texts here. I don't think so. I guess that's it. So it's not, these are all texts in the Septuagint, just a subset that I selected that were second century BC or later text, but it gives us a sense of the range of possibility uh, for various compositions for that particular morphological feature. So something, something of a point of view or perspective um, that we can take. Uh, let me open up the, um, I should have a link to this already. Let me bring it up real quick. So if we go to this link here, which I will put in the video description, you can see where I've deposited uh, the Diorsis DuckDB. So it's a single file. It's about one gigabyte. So you should be able to download it. I won't endorse the uh, data one way or the other, except just to say that I'm, I'm making this available. Um, I have uh, structured the data uh, in some, some new ways. So it certainly pulls from the data that's already there, but there's also uh, various transformations that happen um, some of the data is extracted from um, the TEI header of the, the 820 XML files, which took this took a few days to, to build and extract and transform um, using a, you know, one of my laptops. And then uh, the, the word table um, uses a particular uh, conventions, naming conventions that are used by Bob Gorman and Vanessa Gorman in their work on syntactical tree banks of Greek. So I want to be able to correlate the Diorisis data with the ancient Greek and Latin dependency tree bank data that the Gormans and Greg Crane and others have produced. Um, and then especially recently, Alec Kirsmakers in the Glaux project has just released 20 million word tokens that are syntactically tagged in, in Greek. Uh, so he, uh, with the 1400 documents. So I want to be able to tie those two together. And Bob Gorman has developed uh, a method for parsing uh, Greek syntactical tree banks. So I'm, I'm borrowing a few here, of uh, the relevant field names that Bob uses, but only uh, here, those that would apply to the Diorisis data. One uh, caveat about the Diorisis data is that the tags are not always conclusive. So you know, if a word could be morphologically a dative or a genitive or evocative, uh, it, it will list multiple tags. So it doesn't necessarily make a, a decision or a probabilistic a determination about, or, or a human-based determination about what the actual form is, where the Glaucs data and the ancient Greek and Latin dependency tree banks data do make a determination, a single choice about what the morphological form is. Uh, some of them are somewhat ambig ambiguous in the uh, in those like medio passive could have a middle sense or a passive sense, but it's still a single value that's chosen for each of those fields. So, you know, with that caveat that there's a little bit of ambiguity in some of the fields in, in Diorsis, uh, it's still a lot of highly valuable data, specific words, specific lemmas, and uh, a variety of morphological features. Some completely unambiguous, some somewhat ambiguous. Um, and then uh, I've also used the Glaux uh, TLG ID, which essentially four digits hyphen three digits uh, as a way of, and it comes from the, th the source language Greca, um, with the author coming first and then a document ID coming next. But I wanted to be able to tie together the Diorsis data and the Glaux data. So this is the structure of the, the database. It's now available. So you can use this DOI, uh, Zenodo. 11, 26, 11, 45, uh, to get to um, this database. You can download it if you would like, and then you can start to build and run queries on it. So that's there, uh, please take a look. And uh, once you download it, uh, and the, uh, the Diorsis search program also can have you download the corpus just in XML though, not as one single database file, but um, let me just show a little bit of the background of, of how I built the database. Uh, so DuckDB is essentially a SQL database um, service 
Uh, it's, it's more and more popular in data science, especially if you're doing big data, work on big data. It allows for very powerful and quick queries of a lot of SQL data. So here we'll be put together a database that includes the, the entire Diorsus corpus, 10 million words. Um, it went through various conversion functions. So there's lots of little shorthand references to morphological features, and those need to be kind of separated out into what they're referring to. So in the case of like ACC, that's going to be a reference to case. Dual would be a reference to number. Ploop would be reference to pluperfect as a tense and so on. So I kind of parse these, including different idioms, which can be present in multiple values in a given field. Again, Diorsis might not just have one value, it may have multiple values or something could reflect multiple Greek idioms or multiple Greek voices or what have you. And then um, there's a, a conversion function that I use. Uh, well, that's that's this, this pointing back to the conversion function, but this is the script that populates the database. It goes basically XML file by XML file, pulls the, the data, parses it, converts it as needed. And then here's the, here's a, a way to read the database itself. Uh, I'm just going to clear out my environment so you can see that this is all fresh and I'll, I'll make this a little bit larger. So this is just going to open up um, the first 40, 40 values in both the table, a document table. Uh, so it pulls the, again, uh, the TLG ID. We have an author value here. All this is in the TI header, the name of the document, genre, which the Diorsis project provided, which is excellent, and then a subgenre as well. And then the date created, I think this is a particularly interesting data point. I'm not always in agreement with how the Diorsis project tagged dates, particularly regarding New Testament text, because it tends to take a very conventional or traditional view of the dates of the text. But just having chronological tags for all these can become really interesting when we start to do various analyses. And these are calculations just based on uh, sentence counts and words counts that I, I calculated um, as I was putting these together. Um, location isn't filled out currently, but I wanted to put it there because I think there could be a lot of value in assigning locations to all of these documents as well if we wanted to start to create like a geographical map of linguistic patterns. And then the final one is Glauk's, uh, Glauk's field, which is simply a Boolean true-false. Is the document in the Glauk's corpus or not? And the vast majority of the uh, Diorsis um, texts are in the Glauk's corpus, which can allow us to run queries on both and then cross-validate results, right? Uh, just adds another layer of, um, you know, of confirmation, scientific confirmation. This is just the tail end of... Um, of these documents, you can see there's 820, uh, quite a variety going from 6th, 7th century BCE to 4th, 5th century CE. And then here's the uh, the Word document. So I created a sort of a composite word key using the TLG ID plus uh, a unique ID. That's a sequential ID for the document itself. Sentence ID, this is the word within the sentence, the form. Uh, the lemma, and I could show you in the Diorsis itself what this looks like. So, you know, the kind of conversion that's going on. So here's here's one Diorsis document. And uh, you can see how everything is, you know, we have things like the creation date. I mentioned that before, genre and subgenre, those get pulled. But each, each word has its own set of tags and attributes. So all this was essentially pulled and parsed and expanded out. Um, as needed. So this is this is kind of the raw data, you might say. And then this is the structured, but XML is a structured data form, but this is structured in, in a database format. Um, that's, you know, clear and unambiguous. Um, so it has a self part of speech, a self person, this would all typically apply only for verbs, uh, the number, the tense, uh, the mood, the voice, the gender, the case, the degree, those are typically just for adjectives, uh, the idioms, and then prosody, that's like metrical value. Uh, so that's that's that. Um, so now that this is all in database format, uh, to my knowledge, for the first time. Uh, and it could be that the Diorsis project folks 
have already compiled their own databases and and maybe just not shared them yet. Uh, maybe they have shared them and I just don't know about it, but I just wanted to do this for my own research to be able to run really quick and sophisticated queries of Greek language patterns um, uh, to, to assist in research on especially early Christian texts and, and where they fit into the broader universe of Greek language patterns and, and their evolutions. So um, this is, uh, we just read through the database. We can also do just a quick count. So you can see how many tokens we're dealing with. Uh, we have 11, 11 million, and this would include uh, punctuation marks as part of the tokens. We can inspect uh, words here. So um, here we're just running a query and then it'll output to word tokens. And we're just pulling the last five words from each document. So this is just kind of a quality control uh, measure. So we can just see what the last last five uh, tokens are of, of any given document. We're seeing here some punctuation marks that are a little interesting that might not be the best in terms of lemmas, but that's pretty rare, I think, on the whole. You don't get a lot of those uh, brackets in the Dioris' data. So, yep, this all looks pretty good. And let's see. Um, and then we can start to do run query. So this is where it gets really, really interesting, where we can start to do much more sophisticated analysis. So in this case, uh, compiled using ChatGPT as uh, my coding buddy, um, compiled some queries, in this case, that pull from the works of Flavius Josephus, Lucian of Samosata, the New Testament, and the Septuagint and I can define the features. So here I'm just looking for words that have the trigram arc, A-R chi or alpha rho chi, which is one I had brought up before in previous presentations on YouTube because it's a particular trigram that occurs quite frequently in Luke compared to uh, the Gospel of Marcion, uh, usually in verb, verbal form. So the verb archamai uh, or arco, uh, occurs quite a bit in canonical Luke and very seldom, if ever, in Marcion's Gospel. So I saw that as, as evidence of a later uh, redactional voice uh, in canonical Luke. So if we were, if we were to run this query, and again, I'll, I'll just clear this out real quick so that you know, I'm pulling from fresh data, pulling freshly from the database. So uh, to open a DuckDB database connection, you, you know, use this con, C-O-N language, uh, to open the connection. And uh, so, yeah, let's go, go ahead and run it and see what we get. So was, you can see how quickly that was. It was probably like three seconds. Um, I could put a timer on it if I wanted to. But uh, And what it produced is query results by document. So, and this is sorted in order of frequency. So it appears here from the query that we ran, second John actually comes in highest in frequency of the trigram arc AR uh, alpha rho chi since it occurs two times in only 245 words. That's not a huge sample, so it might throw things off. A larger sample is going to be preferable. Jude also has a particularly high frequency, as does Hebrews. That's interesting. Lucian uses that trigram quite a bit. Josephus does as well. And then if we go down through other texts, you can see it, it diminishes pretty frequently or diminishes pretty significantly as we go down. So. Uh, there's quite a range in Lucian's own compositions. There's quite a range in the Septuagint. Lucian can be both toward the bottom and the toward the top of this very same list. So there's quite a bit of flexibility in, in this uh, range uh, within the, so may, maybe not always a typical author feature or consistent author feature, uh, but it still gives us, you know, one characteristic that might be interesting to, to observe. I wrote another query and this one is going to do um, the optative. So this is the, the one that I was running before. So how, how frequently does the optative mood occur in these same authors? So Josephus, I think, is part of the query. Lucian, New Testament text, and the Septuagint. I could add more. But um, let me, again, clear this out so you can see that I'm pulling freshly from the database and just how, how quick this goes. So uh, I'm gonna run this. Oh, I need to correct a, 
a path, a file path. There we go. Okay, so uh, as outputs to the same files, and um, we have by document. So how often does the optative occur? Looks like Lucian is far and away the most frequent user of the optative in this uh, sampling, and it's highly characteristic. So there is quite a range, but Lucian can consistently, I mean, he's got the top 47 occurrences on this list. So optative, frequent optative uses is, is highly, highly characteristic of Lucian. Uh, in among the Septuagint, the highest is fourth Maccabees, then Ruth, and then Flavius Josephus, the Antiquities comes next at around 0.5 frequency. And then we could go down Judas pretty high, actually. Again, small sample size there. Some of the other epistles in the New Testament. And we could keep going down. So Marcion's Gospel, for instance, has a very low frequency. Here we can see within New Testament text, Matthew actually has the lowest frequency. Now it says probably not coincidental that uh, Marcion's Gospel in many ways is closer to Matthew because they're both depending on uh, a Q, Q source, though it's a significantly different Q than most scholars think. Uh, anyway, so the, the, we can see very quick queries, but one of the other things we can do because we have date created, and this is something you won't find in the Diorsa search program because uh, Alessandro didn't build in uh, the ability to look for dates, but we can start now to group results by date, you know, by specific year. Essentially, this is something like a Greek engram tool, and this could very easily be turned into a visualization. So we can see that the optative, in this case, occurs very infrequently uh, in the third century BC among the samples we have. It occurs very infrequently in the second century BC samples we have. So we get into the first century, middle of the first century CE. It's still pretty infrequent. It's upping a little bit. It gets way higher at the end of the first century. And this is, again, where I might want to quibble with some of the dates that the Georgesis project assigned to texts in the New Testament, because again, they're assuming traditional dates, like putting Luke around 80, canonical Luke around 80, when canonical Luke was probably finalized in the 130s, 140s, or 150s. Um, so to me, it's interesting, but not coincidental that we get a high rate of frequency here in the late first century among many texts that are associated with the New Testament, uh, as well as Josephus and then a high rate here in the second quarter of the second century. And that's because I think a lot of these New Testament texts are traditionally dated to the late first century, probably belong to the second quarter of the second century, uh, where, where we see this these uh, frequencies occurring a lot more among non-Christian or non-canonical Christian literature. Uh, so we can begin now uh, using this database to do like time mapping, chronological mapping, of linguistic patterns. The TLG project allows us to do some of that, but their ngram viewer tool is not particularly useful in my experience, nor quick. Uh, but the DuckDB allows, again, just like three seconds to run very sophisticated queries, pulling in dates, grouping by dates, and doing these sorts of things. So I think this, this could be a very useful resource for people doing computational linguistics work more broadly, especially in Greek. Um, and that includes uh, early Christian texts. So um, that's it for today's episode. I just wanted to show that, point people to where uh, this resource is, um, where it's living on um, uh, the web. So let me, again, just point that out. There we go. I'll conclude with this, just uh, to go back to that Zenodo site. Well, let me uh, look up to the original. Uh, here's here's where the Diorsis project uh, files live, if you want to go see that on Figshare. So you can download the entire corpus, uh, but the DuckDB version of it is now available as of May 23rd, 2024 on Zenodo. So please check it out. Please uh, use it. Again, I'm not endorsing. There's no like warranties or, you know, I probably should put in a, like a disclaimer, um, but it's, this is all pretty simple data. Um, and it's it's uh, essentially just all pulled from uh, the, the Diorsis XML data, as I mentioned before. All right, thanks. That's it. I hope you have a good night. Thanks, bye.